the people were desperate. I mean, basically, what happens with inflation, that sort of price inflation, is that people end up starving. Um, and you, and w- when you get the middle classes just completely impoverished, you know, what do they do? I mean, they probably try and leave the country and go somewhere else. That's not going to be an option in a worldwide, uh, let's say, a dollar-led collapse of fiat currencies. But you can see how effectively the sort of hyperinflation allows outsiders to come in and basically rob the population of their property. So what we're talking about is not a pleasant experience. It really is not. It's going to be very nasty. It will be just okay for those who have protected themselves with the ownership of some gold and silver. And I'm talking physical, I'm not talking about paper. And then you've got a problem, of course, you know, you've got the security issues and all the rest of it. You know, it's not an easy thing that we're talking about. This is something which actually is quite difficult and people need to think through what they're actually doing. Place some sort of assessment on whether, you know, someone like me (laughs) who says, you know, we're facing the end of paper currencies is actually credible and what he's saying is credible. And then work out okay, what's going to be our insurance just in case McLeod is right? This is Donegan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver dealer with Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized, private service from one of the oldest and best respected companies in the business. 30 years strong, A-plus rated by the Better Business Bureau, zero complaints, licensed and bonded, insured delivery or vault storage or IRAs, excellent prices, privacy and confidentiality, pay by check, money order, ACH or wire, satisfaction guaranteed. Call me directly at 419-819-9209 or my associate at 310-562-6400 or email us at kaiser at milesfranklin.com. Welcome back to Liberty and Finance and Reluctant Preppers. We have this returning guest. Alistair McLeod is the head of research at goldmoney.com. He's been a prescient forecaster of strains in the banking system and the fiat currency system. He joins us again this Monday, March 8th, 2021. Alistair, thanks for coming back on. Thank you for asking me. I like I like prescient, I must say. <laughs> well, uh, a lot of our viewers have been following your writings, uh, your analysis, and your prognostications about what may be transpiring. You've, you've talked about the mile markers that we're passing on the road to destruction of the U.S. dollar current uh, world's reserve currency and some outstanding strains on the both the US banking system, European banking system, the euro, all kinds of things that uh, somehow managed to keep getting uh, swept under the rug through one yep. miraculous way or another. But we'd like to get your, your latest update on that situation at a very high level. And then we'll zoom in on some viewers questions that have been presented uh, to us for your interview as well. Okay. Well, um, I think the big problem coming up is lack of balance sheet space on uh, the U.S. big banks, because, as you know, they are limited in terms of the relationship between their equity and their total balance sheet. I'm putting it very, very simply. Mm -hmm. There are all sorts of other things like, you know, how you calculate um, the risk element in uh, the assets on the asset side. Uh, of of the bank's balance sheet, uh, right. you also you know you also have calculations to do on the uh, liability side. You know, I mean, if you've got loads of um, of of if you like the sort of dubious <laughs> counterparties, then obviously you know there is a risk on on that side. Uh, so, and and also in terms of time, I mean, um, if you're looking at the liability side, you know how much of it is short term and how much of it is long term. Long term is good. Short term is not so good. So you've got all these sort of factors that uh, work together. And I was looking at the updated Basel III regulations, and that's about 1300 pages to give you an example of just how complex the whole thing is. But within that context, um, the American banks, I think ever since the repo crisis back in September, 2019 
have been short of balance sheet space. And this is why um, on April the 1st um, of um, last year, uh, the Fed created, if you like, the ability of um, uh, banks to uh, lend more um, by excluding from, you know, the various um, ratios and so on, uh, U.S. Treasury debt and also the reserves. Now, that exclusion ends at the end of March, this current current month. OK, so if it's not extended, it looks to me as if um, the banks might have to consider turning away deposits, um, trying to reduce their bank lending. Now, this is just completely counterproductive as far as Fed policy is concerned, because what they want to see is the continuation of the expansion of bank credit. But because of all the inflationary financing of government debt and all the rest of it that's going on and the attempt to keep uh, financial markets bubbling by QE, and remember, there's 120 billion a month of that, and that basically is targeted at pension funds and insurance companies, which is why um, the stock market is so strong, because um, the whole idea of QE is the Fed buys relatively riskless assets, and this is agency debt and U.S. Treasuries, gives the, um, the institutions, pension funds and insurance companies cash and effectively encourages them to go out and buy more risky assets than the treasuries which they've just sold to the Fed. And that is why the stock market is so buoyant. Uh, buoyant. I mean, we're looking at 120 billion a month being pushed into financial assets. And um, to some extent, it's coming out of US treasuries and going into other things. So um, this situation requires ex an expansion of uh, bank balance sheets, because uh, if you look at the pension fund or the insurance company, they don't have an account with uh, the Fed. They have an account with a bank which has an account with the Fed. So the way in which the flows go is um, the Fed agrees to buy, say, a um, billion dollars worth of treasuries off a pension fund. But the payment flows go through the pension funds bank and the credit goes to the reserve account of uh, the pension funds bank. So you can see that, you know, the bank is just acting as an intermediary in this case, but its reserves grow because that is where the payment flows go. So um, the fact that, um, that the Fed had to um, uh, create a, a synthetic increase in the balance sheet capacity by giving a you know, sort of, a, if you like, a pass on um, treasuries and uh, and uh, the reserve accounts uh, that the banks have with it, you can see that there is absolutely no um, space in the bank's balance sheets. So um, what do they do at the end of this month when that temporary um, relief, if you like, is over and done with? <laughs> the, you know, this is something we've yet to see. I would actually expect the Fed to come out with an announcement in the next week or two to extend that. Um, but in a general sense, the problem we really have is with, with all the financing by inflation, by the Fed, let us say, buying in treasuries, buying in agency debt, pushing cash out, the bank's balance sheets being very, very stretched. We've got a situation where yet more inflation in the current year I'm, by inflation, I mean of money, hmm. uh, just cannot be handled by the system. So this is going to be a big, big problem. And uh, we can see other things happening which um, aren't really that encouraging. I mean, the yield, for example, on the 10-year Treasury uh, shot up to 1.6% yesterday. I mean, today I've got it uh, sitting. I'm sorry, I'm looking above you slightly at the screen. No problem. Uh, I've, yeah, I've got it 1.601. You know, this is... This is up from 1% in um, two or three weeks. I mean, you know, it's been, it's just just taken off. Um, so what happens there? I mean, you've got, you know, sort of people are hoping that the Fed will go in for yield curve control, which basically means that um, they will buy longer dated U.S. Treasuries um, and swap them, if you like, for shorter dated U.S. Treasuries and that way suppress the yields at the long end. 
But such is the U.S. Tre uh, US Treasury's financing that actually um, their average maturity is something like four or five years. So the ability to do this is somewhat limited. Nonetheless, the banks are sitting there, no balance sheet capacity. They're seeing the value of um, 10 year um, treasuries going down the pan because that's the other side of the rise in the yield. I mean, the, you know, the principal is going down. Um, and anything longer, I mean, the banks tend not to have things long. I mean, the banks tend to, for them, the maximum maturity is usually about five years, but they're still making losses, even on that uh, sort of maturity. So um, here we are, we're sort of coming up to the half year stage in the current fiscal year for the US government. And uh, there are quite a few problems coming up on the horizon. They have, uh, I think, now passed um, completely 1.9 trillion uh, stimulus. They have got about 1.6 trillion sitting in uh, the uh, government's general account at the um, at the Fed. So in theory, I mean, you know, a lot of that is already financed. But, um, you know, are they going to spend that money on doing that? I mean, the the, the the thought um, a couple of weeks ago was that what they would be doing is instead of spending the money into existence, um, you know, sort of out of the Fed into the general economy, what they would do is they would um, not renew uh, maturing treasury bills, which would have the effect of pushing money into the financial system. Um, now, the financial system is dependent on, in on monetary inflation. And when I look, I mean, I sort of did a quick rundown on some of the commodities uh, this morning and looking at various other things. And I was rather struck by the fact that these things peaked in sort of early February. Um, but now you can see that commodities, many, I mean, not all of them, but some of them come off the top. Oil is an exception. Um, you know, that's that's gone on up. Uh, cryptocurrencies seem to have run out of steam for the moment. Um, gold is being panned. Um, you know, this sort of radon silver seems to have fizzled out. Um, and that has sort of now fallen from 30 down to 25. So you've got all these sort of signs that there's not enough money in the system. We need more money. So what are they going to do? I mean, it looks to me like the Fed is very shortly going to come into sort of a second version of what they did last month, last March. And you may recall that on the 20th of March, they cut interest rates by one and a half percent down to zero. And then on the 23rd of March, uh, they effectively said whatever it takes. They introduced um, a higher rate of um, QE, 120 billion a month. Still rolls over, still rolls on. I mean, you know, this is I haven't been talking about this in the numbers at all. I mean, this is a separate issue. And on top of that, they came up with an awful lot of um, stuff to um, uh, help uh, businesses, uh, you know, sort of borrow, giving banks guarantees so that they could lend again. <laughs> banks for that an awful lot of balance sheet space. Um, basically targeted at businesses which might in other, you know, otherwise lay off people and create a higher level of unemployment because their twin mandate is, um, you know, keep a maximum level of employment uh, consistent with the rate of inflation of no more than 2%. Oh, and that was another thing they changed. I think it was around about last August. They turned around and said, well, 2%, we'll look at an average of 2%, um, not um, a sort of final level of 2%. So, if it shoots up to 2.5, 2.6%, they'll ride it. 3%, they'll ride it. And remember that we're talking about um, uh, inflation as measured by the CPI. And we've discussed this on your, you know, your program before, that actually this is, this is nothing like the rate of inflation. I mean, if you're looking at the prices, you know, a, a figure closer to somewhere between 7 and 10% is actually what's been going on. It's been going on every year since the great financial crisis, bar the first year afterwards. So, I mean, the, the whole thing, uh, DK, is a, is a massive mess. And uh, we're going to have a very interesting time seeing how the various aspects of this get resolved um, in the next few weeks, because March the 31st is an important date.
for two reasons. It's the end of the first quarter of the calendar year, which a lot of people work to. But more importantly, as far as the US government is concerned, it's the half year stage in their fiscal year. So this is going to be interesting. It's going to get, I think, potentially violent unless some decisions, inflationary decisions are taken very, very quickly. And then you ask yourself, well, what does this do to the dollar? Well, it can't be good. Um, we have seen, um, you know, the dollar has rallied actually quite significantly. I mean, I think it got down to 89. Looking on my screen, it's now 92.30. Um, you know, we've seen sterling back off from 141 down to 138 something. We've seen the euro um, backing off from 122 to 118.62. So the currencies have come off as well. So it's, it's everything. And it all sort of implies that um, there is, and I hate to use this word, deflationary forces surfacing not actually deflationary uh, forces. It's just that the pace of um, monetary inflation has slowed or it has become insufficient to keep the whole thing bubbling along. So what's the Fed going to do? Well, I think we probably get some sort of announcement in the not too distant future. They've got to allow more balance sheet space on the banks. But how do you do that when internationally you've agreed um, under Basel three rules that, uh, you know, big banks and GSIBs um, have penalties for exceeding the guidelines in terms of the relationship between total assets and equity? It's, it's um, yeah. <laughs> so that's where we are. I'm sorry it's a bit confusing, but I think if I can get the message over that um, we're going to have to see some fairly significant changes um, or um, the, I mean, one one thing that will happen unless we get a, um, if you like, more, more monetary inflation, you know, perhaps QE going up to 150 billion a month or something like that. Um, and the ability of banks, if you like, to handle the increase in the reserves that that would imply, unless we can sort of do something like that, then, the stock market is going to start faltering. And I have to say, it's, you know, recently looking at it, it's been sputtering, if you like, spluttering along rather than progressing. And I and it's very definitely uh, the objective of QE and the objective of the Fed is to keep a wealth creation effect from financial assets going. That they believe is more important than anything else. And if they fail in that, the dollar fails as well. I mean, it, it really is as simple as that, because as we've said before, this was the experience of John Law. You tie a fiat currency to the bubble in financial assets and one goes, they both go. So yeah, it's interesting. You've mentioned the uh, monetary inflation, the in expansion of the, of the currency supply. Uh, what boundaries or inflection points uh, might exist. Is there is there any mathematical or uh, experiential you know, historical precedent or whatever that we can look back to and go, once you pass this particular point, you just can't uh, rein the thing back in. It's gonna start translating into uh, price inflation and so on. Well, I think we've rather passed that point. I mean, to, to, to answer your question another way, uh, and very simply, I mean, the answer is no. We just don't know at what point that, you know, we sort of passed the point of no return. But in terms of US government debt, we have passed the point of no return. I mean, can you imagine a situation whereby Joe Biden turns around and says, we've got to keep our debt under control and doesn't matter what happens, we are going to start paying down our debt or alternatively, it doesn't matter what happens, we're not going to increase our debt anymore. If you can imagine that, you've got more imagination than I have, I think is all I can say. I just don't see it. So we have already passed that point. I mean, the US government is in a debt trap. And, um, you know, given the mandate uh, uh, that the Fed has, uh, you know, sort of maximum employment uh, consistent with a 2% <laughs> suppressed rate of, in, of price inflation, I mean, they're stuck as well. And the, furthermore, they're stuck intellectually because, um, you know, the more we see these guys, I mean, there was an interesting interview with um, a journalist from Wall Street Journal on the Wall Street Journal uh, where Jay Powell was being questioned. And I sat there and listened to it. And I thought, this can't be real. I mean, really. I was actually, I was also interested in 
Uh, not so much his answers, which were complete gobbledygook, which, you know, anyone who understands true economics, if you like, rather than the modern macro neo-Keynesian form, would understand that that's gobbledygook. But there was a man, I thought, who he looked cornered. He couldn't really answer the question with any real conviction. And that was new, I think. Um, he's never really been a really sort of forceful individual. Um, he's been obviously careful in what he says and all the rest of it. And he went into the job with the reputation of being, um, you know, sort of, if you like, um, an enthusiast of um, decent money. Let's put it that way rather than sound. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, the poor man is now turned completely. There is, I, and I sympathize with him because, um, you know, he's dealt a hand. And ah, I think gobbledygook is part of the Fed president's job description. But uh, oh, you yeah. mentioned that the, what you saw as new was this uh, sense of being cornered and not being able to answer, not having. Yes, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of the commentary afterwards seemed to be, um, you know, sort of pretty negative. Um, but, you know, from my point of view, what, what interests me is, you know, I look at this, if you like, the, the body language, the, the way in which someone responds to questions under that sort of duress. And I have to say that the um, if I'd been in, in uh, the position of the uh, Wall Street Journal's um, uh, guy asking the questions, I would have asked a lot more <laughs> a lot more uh, disruptive questions than he did. I thought he was very, very soft, actually, on Jay Powell. Um, but then that's why I would never be invited to um, <laughs> to interrogate Jay Powell. Now, you've mentioned a couple of times in this discussion about the Basel III uh, uh, agreement or deadlines, that sort of thing. Uh, Des Artis asks, can Alistair please briefly explain how he sees the Basel III rules affecting the price of metals? Oh. <laughs> this is an interesting one because various people have read this and come up with various ideas, um, some of which are incredibly bullish for gold. Um, and I think at another extreme, it really doesn't make any difference. Um, I actually had a look at this because one of my Twitter followers asked, um, you know, what did I think? So I thought, oh, right. OK, I've got to swap this up. <laughs> the conclusion I have come to on it is that um, basically what the new, the most recent version of Basel III says is that uh, if a central bank uh, desires to deal with gold as a level one or tier one asset, then uh, it may do so. So this removes it, I think, from something like a 50% 50, 50 um, haircut to zero. That's brilliant. But um, it's not necessarily something that is uh, really that helpful to the banks because um, in the most cases, they don't own any bullion. We're talking about allocated gold in a vault effectively under the bank's control. So, uh, um, or possibly, I suppose, an LBMA member's vault. I think the more important thing is not how the price of gold is likely to be enhanced after the 20, 28th of June, which is the sort of cutoff date, um, but the effect on paper gold trading because paper gold trading still has, um, uh, you know, it's effectively a haircut of 85%. Um, on, this is on the asset side of the balance sheet. So um, what this does is it makes it, you know, if you're going to go, if you're a bank and you're going to go and do something with gold, then it is less expensive on your balance sheet to have it as physical, um, as an asset physical, um, and maybe trade it like that, that's fine, um, than have it as a forward contract on the LBMA. I think there's also um, uh, a possibility that you can do a forward contract on the LBMA without being penalized so long as the settlement is within something like three or five days. So very short term, mm -hmm. in effect, the idea that you can um, cover yourself by buying it forward a month out and um, then close your cover 
as you get closer to the time when you have to deliver or take delivery, um, you know, it just destroys effectively that element of what the LBMA does. And the LBMA in, indeed have, um, uh, have, have written to the Basel Committee and uh, requested that that be reconsidered and Basel Committee have basically said no or ignored it. So I think it really comes from, I mean, the, the benefit to gold comes from uh, the removal, if you like, of um, the availability of um, forward contracts and futures contracts um, as a means of soaking up demand for bullion. Um, if the banks play the gold game less in those two big markets, then there will be excess demand not being satisfied by those markets. And as we've seen, the way in which demand gets crushed basically is that um, the bullion banks just print contracts, you know, sell, 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 sell until the buyers go away or they give up or whatever. And that's, that's actually sort of similar to the situation we've we, we've inherited, if you like, because um, they've managed to reduce open interest basically by, first of all, um, you know, sort of hitting um, uh, the stop losses, um, targeting uh, uh, the hedge funds and had the good fortune to see the hedge funds uh, observe that um, the 10 year Treasury yield has rocketed and therefore taking a simplistic view that uh, this is bad for gold. Um, and uh, I mean, but that's another story and go into that if you want, if, if someone wants to ask that one. But uh, you can see that um, really, I think the real benefit that's going to come to the gold price and silver price is the restriction of paper dealing and the way in which that has been absorbing um, demand. Mm -hmm. That'll be uh, so we'll see that playing out. You said that the there's a couple of key dates coming up, but in this one, it's it's June when the. Uh, uh, it's end June. I mean, or uh, the way the Basel Committee put it, first of July, the new rules come in. So, I mean, I think that <laughs> I haven't looked at the calendar, but I, I guess that's a weekend. So, ah, OK. Yeah. Um, uh, still on the metals and their impact in, uh, in trade. Uh, Paul Ridge asks, Alistair has mentioned that he does not foresee silver returning as money. My question is, why is JP Morgan Chase reputedly buying large amounts of physical silver and amassing it? If it is an accumulation of an asset, why not other assets as well? Can I just correct that? I do see silver returning as money, but what I do not see is a silver standard returning. Um, central banks hold no silver. They hold gold. So in the collapse of fiat currencies, which I expect, their only escape route is to um, uh, change their fiat money into gold substitutes, exchangeable into gold coin. Now, whether they do this sensibly or not, uh, we have yet to see. But that basically is the escape route. Um, silver does have a role as as money under those circumstances, and it is a secondary role, if you like. And I think a wise central bank will say, well, what we will do is we will work a relationship between gold and silver such that silver is exchangeable to a figure like, let's say, you know, 20 ounces of silver to one of gold. Now, the point there is that by making silver um, that sort of relationship, while maintaining the hold on gold, silver will actually circulate as coinage. Uh, within the currency. And I think that is that is desperately important. But what we're looking at, I think, is a situation where we move from currently we're looking at what, 65 um, ounces of silver to one of gold. Yeah. I mean, as as the paper currency situation um, declines, then I think we're likely to see that close. But I'm, you know, I'm not one of the people who sort of think that, um, you know, this is likely to go to 15 to 1 or 10 to 1 or, you know, it should go there sort of thing. I think that probably what will happen is that um, it will go to that sort of um, you know, 20 to 1 type level. I would have that, if you like, as an objective, uh, an ultimate objective on a paper currency collapse for silver. So 
And it will circulate a lot more easily than gold because, um, you know, I mean, we have in this country, we have gold sovereigns. Now, a gold sovereign at the moment is worth around about £320 each in, you know, in fiat currency. Um, now, that is not something that you can go into a shop and buy, you know, buy something with. Um, but uh, when it comes to silver, uh, you know, if let's say there are 20 of those, to, you know, an ounce, I mean, a silver coin weighing, I don't know, something like a quarter of an ounce or something is the sort of thing that you can spend in a shop. Now, I'm not suggesting that you go out and spend silver at, uh, per se in the shop. But the important point is that it can be used for purchases and um, it can be used on a basis which is linked to the price of gold, but linked in such a way that you're not going to get the arbitrage running between the two uh, and disrupting future currency arrangements. All right. Um, now, you've uh, talked about people making the distinction of when monetary, excuse me, when price inflation occurs and people start to lose confidence in the currency once they realize it isn't just prices going up, it's the currency faltering. A yeah. uh, yeah. related question from Angel Ninov, who says, very interested to know how Alistair would differentiate between broad based inflation versus supply demand price increases. Oh. Um, that one's very, very simple. Supply and demand uh, applies to individual um, commodities, goods, whatever. But if you see all commodity prices tending to rise, then, OK, each commodity has got its own story. You know, I mean, you look at copper and you can sort of say, well, you know, there's problems in Chile or <laughs> wherever. Um, or you can look at soybeans and say, well, you know, the, it's it's sort of all stuck in Los Angeles and there are no containers to take it over to China. You know, every commodity has got its own story. But if they're all rising in price, then the common factor is that the currency in which you measure the prices is losing its purchasing power in commodities. Now, if it's doing that and it's doing it also, say, in the case of um let's say gold, silver. Also, if you're looking at cryptocurrencies, if you're looking at uh, stock markets, if you're looking at against other currencies and you get the same story, then it is quite clear the purchasing power of the currency is going down. And since last March, that has actually been the case as far as the dollar is concerned in all those categories. And look at the price of oil. I mean, briefly in April, I think it dipped into negative territory, basically because there's nowhere to store it. Now we're looking at what, 67, 68 dollars. I mean, it's just really taken off. Actually, it has come off a little bit. I'm just looking at it, 64.95. But, you know, you know, the point is that um, all these commodity prices have just gone through the roof. And the interesting thing, and just to add a little addendum to that, is that the first people to actually realize what the Fed was doing were the Chinese. What did they do? They went out and spent their dollars stockpiling copper, oil, um, soybeans, anything, everything. Individual things like lumber have been going up because of house building demand. Mind you, I sort of sometimes wonder in North America when it's absolutely freezing and you've got snow everywhere. <laughs> You know, this is not the season really to be building houses. But anyway, um, no, but that's anyways, actually a good uh, uh, comment. That's actually a good common sense indicator because we've heard from multiple uh, guests and also clients who have called in saying that the rate of home construction and people mm -hmm. relocating despite the winter weather is a, an exceptional sign of uh, the, the desperation of people to, to relocate out of big cities that they perceive mm -hmm. to be, you know, less safe, the urban yeah. flight, and that people are trying to make their move now while they still have the freedom to do so. And it yeah. is driving up not only uh, prices of building materials, but prices of uh, homestead uh, suitable properties all over the country mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Well, we've got the same thing in this country, in, 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 in uh, Britain. I mean, um, prices in London have gone down, whereas in the home counties, which are really the counties that surround it, uh, they've gone up because um, it, you know, who wants to get stuck in an expensive apartment in the middle of London when from the same money you can buy, you know, a five, six bedroomed house with a decent amount of land, you know, well, not not decent for an American, but for a Brit, you know, let's say, something between half an acre and an acre of land. Um, 
uh, and uh, you know you can work from home now you know they suddenly realize this i mean there's just been a complete revolution and it has affected uh, our property market in that way and i guess that it's very very similar um in america yep and uh we have a very high level question here if you can if we can zoom way out and look over at the last century plus from the foundation of the fed because you're talking a lot about the sort of end game strains on the banking system mm. uh if we look at the the effect of that over more than a century uh, mutant Rayaf says if the one dollar silver eagle was the equivalent of one fiat federal reserve note in 1913 then with the fiat federal reserve note being devalued by pick a number he says 98 percent we've heard that said by a couple of, couple other people yeah. shouldn't the one dollar silver eagle be the equivalent of at least 49 fiat federal reserve notes today well you can't be so mechanical unfortunately i mean the bit about 98 percent is true um uh, but you wouldn't do it by silver what you'd look at is gold i mean going from uh 20.67 an ounce before 1934 um you know, you just divide that by the current gold price and you come out with a, you know, the sort of 2% left, you know, and uh, maybe even a bit less than that. So that bit is true. But um, I wouldn't I wouldn't really sort of try and, um, you know, double guess that with silver, because the other problem is it's not just necessarily the, pr the purchasing power of gold going down, but um, I think in the final collapse, you'll find that the purchasing power of gold goes up in its own right. And we saw this, and I, I keep on quoting this um, lovely story uh, from um, an Austrian uh, uh, author of great renown, Stefan Zweig, who wrote uh, about those times, um, uh, uh, you know, the 1920 to 23 era, uh, the great inflation. And he described how you could buy a six bedroomed house in a swanky part of Berlin for a hundred dollars and a hundred dollars at that time was just under five ounces of gold you know so um i think if you've got some gold you might look forward to those times it'll be a little bit of um compensation for all the other <laughs> disruptions uh from a currency collapse speaking of those times this last question we have is along those lines safety compliance consulting services asks I'm looking for an exit strategy for my silver. When this monopoly game ends, I'm looking for some income producing assets. What will residential income producing real estate do in this crash? Or are there other suggestions? Okay. Um, well, let's go back to 1920, um, In real terms, measured in gold, obviously from what I've said, uh, property crashed. And one of the things that drove the property crash was the um, complete valuelessness of rentals because, you know, rents tend to be pretty fixed. I mean, you, can, you, you don't adjust them sort of, you know, week by week or month by month. You know, you sort of set it and you've probably got a lease on the, you know, you've given a lease to someone and you probably have the opportunity to renew or review the rent once a year. And this, in a hyperinflation, just makes property completely valueless. I mean, you know, it's it's uh, it's the real driver, if you like, of prices. Um, so I would say that under those circumstances, I mean, basically, when the crash happens, certainly use your silver to buy property, but you probably get it a lot more cheaply than you would think is reasonable at this particular moment. So I think that's the way I do it. What else do you buy? Well, um, I mean, gold, gold and silver, I mean, particularly gold, silver also when this, you know, when if you're looking at 65 times on the gold silver ratio, then obviously silver is cheap in a currency collapse. So I would look to ride um, the fall in the gold silver ratio, perhaps down to somewhere um, under 40 before switching back into gold. As for income producing, I think I've answered the bit about income producing, unless you go, you invest in a gold mine, which um, can, you know, which has actually got um, the liquidity of capital resources. I mean, in the broader sense, you know, not only money, but also employees and, you know, technicians and all the rest of it and equipment, um, you know, there you've got a chance that the, income will keep pace, if you like, with the decline or it will compensate you for, to a degree for the decline in the purchasing power of the fiat currency. 
It's very interesting. I want to just bring home, uh, before I let it go, something you said about rental property, because you've said it in a way that other guests haven't, and at least it's, hearing, it's hitting my ear in a new way. And that is that, because we've talked about coming uh, collapse, we have, we have tens of millions of people unemployed in the U.S. Uh, that's, yeah. there's, been, there's been rent forbearance and that sort of thing. But what you're talking about, if you get into a currency inflation where the value of the currency is dropping rapidly and the, the poor landlords are stuck with the mm. fixed rate of uh, rent that they can yeah. collect over a lease period for a year or whatever, then it's not that there isn't, it's not that there aren't people who may have lost their homes who are needing a place to live. It's not that people aren't, uh, that there isn't a, a need and a demand for rental uh, homes on the part of uh, the populace, but it's the, the fact that nobody wants to be a landlord at that point because mm. the, the rent is worthless <laughs> that these people yeah. are paying. And so their the landlords may be desperate to dump this this turkey and, and move on to yeah. something that's going to be sustaining for them. So anyway, that that becoming uh, a contrarian, not, right. becoming a contrarian at the right point, there might be yeah. a, a move that people should consider. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, the point you make is absolutely, absolutely right. And uh, um, I mean, going back to the evidence from uh, writers like Stefan Zweig, um, uh, Austrian estates, you know, sort of lovely schloss with, I don't know, a thousand acres, or whatever. They were changing hands for peanuts because the people were desperate. I mean, basically what happens with inflation, that sort of price inflation is that people end up starving. Um, and you and w when you get the middle class is just completely impoverished. You know, what do they do? I mean, they probably try and leave the country and go somewhere else. That's not going to be an option in a worldwide, uh, let's say, a dollar led collapse of fiat currencies. But you can see how effectively the sort of hyperinflation allows outsiders to come in and basically rob the population of their property. So what we're talking about is not a pleasant experience. It really is not. It's going to be very nasty. It will be just OK for those who have protected themselves with the ownership of some gold and silver. And I'm talking physical, I'm not talking about paper. And then you've got a problem, of course, you know, you've got the security issues and all the rest of it. You know, it's not an easy thing that we're talking about. This is something which actually is quite difficult and people need to think through what they're actually doing. Place some sort of assessment on whether, you know, someone like me <laughs> who says, you know, we're facing the end of paper currencies, is actually credible and what he's saying is credible and then work out okay what's going to be our insurance just in case mcleod is right and these decisions these these are complex decisions and they're, they're decisions for each individual to take and i mean the other thing i um i strongly believe is you just cannot abandon your community under these circumstances you have got to be helpful to your community and that probably means that um, you know, the idea of making money and, you know, hanging on to everything and, you know, waiting for the right moment to go and rob someone of their property for peanuts. I mean, that's only one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is you've got family, friends, people in your community who are not going to be as well off as you if you have got literally one ounce of gold. And um, this is difficult. This is very, very difficult. And, um, you know, I don't think you can abandon your community, but I think what you've got to think through is the context of your position in the community. I mean, you know, it just seems to me that there is a, almost a sort of society duty, if you like, um, forget government and all the rest of it. We're talking about the people who are around you. Um, they are going to be desperate. A lot of them will turn to thieving. That is a problem that you also have to consider. But I think there's an element of having to just consider the whole humanity of the situation, which is going to be pretty ghastly, however you've managed to protect yourself. It's always good to speak with you, Alistair, and always appreciate your experience, perspective, and your analysis, and also now your, your um, thoughtful philosophy that we can help uh, get us mentally and psychologically prepared for what's coming. Uh, if people want to stay in touch with us, no matter what happens, please go to libertyandfinance.com. Over in the left-hand side, put your name and email address. Make sure you get on our free, free, free newsletter that puts all of Alistair's interviews as well as all of our other guests and any links that they provide. 
and we'll keep in touch with you about where we're publishing. Alistair, if people want to find out more about your research and your writings, where should they go? Well, goldmoney.com and hit the research tab. Um, I write an article which is published every Thursday, um, sort of more or less late morning, early afternoon EST. Uh, and I do a market report on precious metals, which is published on Friday, following day at about the same time. Very good. Alistair, as always, thank you for joining us on Liberty and Finance. That was my pleasure, DK. If you've decided that now is the right time for you to protect your family's financial future by acquiring physical precious metals, gold and silver, I'm delighted to let you know that I have now become a licensed dealer's representative for Miles Franklin, one of the oldest and most trusted names in bullion dealerships. And we can provide you with physical delivery to your personal possession or to professional fault storage or precious metals IRAs. Just email me at libertyandfinance at protonmail.com and please include your name and phone number in your email to libertyandfinance at protonmail.com. We'll get right back with you and find out how to best meet your needs so that you can either begin or increase your acquisition of physical precious metals now and protect your family's future starting today. To acquire gold and silver, just go to libertyandfinance.com. When the main site comes up, click on Bullion Sales. That's libertyandfinance.com, Bullion Sales. You'll see my name, Donegan Kaiser, my phone number, and my associate, Kaiser Johnson, his phone number, our email, libertyandfinance at protonmail.com.